Well, I want to encourage you. We ask for it. You matter. God's plan through faith and science. You matter to God. God's plan through faith and science. A lot of people think today that science and Christianity or science in the Bible cannot be congruent. You can't, they're, they're at opposite with each other. We've heard a lot in the last five years, I believe the science. I believe the science. Well, all science really is, is an observation that's measurable through hypothesis, and then you come up with a theory. And then you try to make sure it happens over and over again, you come up with a theory. But science has changed a lot throughout the ages. They used to believe, for example, that the earth was flat. And there's still some people, we're going to pray for them, that still believe the earth is flat. Uh, there's some people like, for example, Galileo. He, was, he went to the Inquisition and he got defrocked from the church his last eight years of his life because he didn't believe that the earth was the center of the universe. He believed that we revolved around the sun. Now, I know a lot of people may not believe that, but a lot of people believe they're the center of the universe. And so why does it really matter? Because a lot of people basically say this, you can't trust the Bible. The Bible is a figment of it, it's basically a bunch of stories that are just been overused and they're, you know, they're allegory and you really can't trust it. The science of the Bible is wrong. And then there are people within the church, a creation, uh, um, what do you call it, museum, right? You have the Ark Museum and all that. And they believe, and they teach very strongly that it was six 24-hour days that the entire universe was made, including the earth, was made in six days. And if you don't believe that, not them, but some people say, if you don't believe that, then you are compromising Scripture, and Scripture can be used to say anything you want. The problems we see in our society is people don't take Scripture seriously, and if we let that one go of, of seven 24-hour days, then we're going to give up everything. All the nonsense we see in our culture today where science is denied is because people don't believe in the six-day or seven-day creation. And they're very adamant against it, and they believe that God has done it in six days. Which, which one do you believe? I'm not going to tell you. But let me just say, God can do anything. So what I'd like to do today is, 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 first of all, to let you understand that science and the Bible are not incompatible at all. In fact, the Bible has spoke about scientific theories that we have today long before science ever got around to understanding what it was. And I believe, hopefully when we're done here today, I, I am not a scientist, right? But anything, what the Bible says about science is true. And you're gonna see that today. And that you can trust the Bible. And so, but let me, let me just go ahead and, and mention to you, first of all, that the Bible was written not as a scientific book, but a theological book, theology, study of God, biology, study of biology, right? Cosmopology, if I said it correctly, I think that's taking care of hair. But anyhow, that's the same. Uh, but that's a study of the universe, cosmicology. You're studying the universe. And so what the Bible says about these things, except for taking care of your hair, is that it, it is designed by God. Now, why does that matter? It matters because many of us are being told that we evolved from apes. That we just, some, somehow or another, there's some premortal soup, okay, and something jumped out of the soup, and it grew legs and walked around, and, and, and basically, that's like me, it's like getting a nail truck and a lumber truck, putting it here in the middle of the parking lot, God knows how the parking lot got here, and a whirlwind came by and built this church. How ridiculous would that be, Right? And yet, that's what some people are proposing, that it all happened by accident. Now, I think that's amazing. I think it takes more faith to believe that a, I can drop a penny on the floor and it's going to build itself the Empire State Building, right? And that's pretty amazing. Oh, you're making fun of it. No, I'm, I mean, that's what they're basically saying. So, so who put all the information and the technology and the codes in that little penny to make the Empire State Building? So... In many ways, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than how some people say, well, which one do you believe? We'll get into it in a few moments, okay? 
So a lot of people talk about that. So what has happened is um, people often ridiculize Christianity because you guys are so stupid. You think the earth is 6,000 years old. We know better than that. And they make fun of us and all that. And and let me just say, if God wants to make the earth in six days, he can do what he wants. Why? Because God is God. So that's the first thing I'm going to say off the bat. But did he? And what do we learn about science and the Bible? And what does it matter for? It matters simply this. If you believe that you evolved from apes, if you believe you're a random chance, if you believe that you're no more than an animal of a higher order, you're going to act like what you believe. What you believe about yourself, you will become. So when you're being told that you are just a biological group of cells, you're just a fetus, not a child, When you believe that, then you lose focus, and the enemy wants to destroy humanity because they're made in the image of God. Man and woman are made in the image of God. And so what happens is we begin to lose focus, and why do you think people don't care about life? Because I'm nothing more than a biological group of cells. So, But if you know you're made in the image of God, if you know that you have purpose like the rest of the universe, it changes everything. And so I want to let you know a couple of things really important. That's why this matters for. People are all into science. and the We're not going to be a science class because I'm not a scientist. Okay? But the Bible says this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And some actually, it says in the Hebrew, it says chaos. And the Spirit of God hovered over the chaos. And the darkness was on the face of the water, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, over the chaos. Let me just say to you today that whatever you're going through today, the Spirit of God is hovering over your life. The Spirit of God has a purpose for your life. God has designed you on purpose, with a purpose. You are not an accident. There might be so-called accident parents, but there's no accident children. You are made in the image of God, and you matter to God. You have a purpose. You're not an accident, and you matter. Now, that's important to realize. Why? Because everything God does has matter. So how does that work? What about my chaos? We all have chaos, right? We all have chaos in our life. I have some chaos in my life. You do? Yeah, I'm not going to talk about it right now. But we got chaos in our life, things that are out of order. Maybe your finances, maybe your relationships, maybe your habits, maybe your thoughts, maybe your health, right? But the good news is, because we serve a God who created the universe and put it together, he can take and put your universe together. He can take your chaos and make it orderly with a purpose. And so if you understand that the universe was made on purpose, you need to understand that you are made on purpose. And if you have chaos, God can take that chaos and make it order and give you a purpose. So this is not just a theoretical thing about oh, science and the Bible. No, this is about you because you're made in the image of God. Now, how does that work? What about my chaos? Does my life matter? Absolutely, your life matters. I don't care if you're 88 years old and on your deathbed, your life matters. And every season, there is a reason. And every part of life, God has a redemptive plan. And our objective is for you to know God, to find the freedom he has for you, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference in the world. Does my life matter? It does matter. Do I have a purpose? Yes, you have a purpose. And our objective is to help you find your purpose. I know it's very difficult. I remember being in my early 20s and everything that I built fell apart and I didn't know how, I didn't have purpose. Then I doubted the existence of God and I was pretty bad. I was like, oh my God, God doesn't exist. I don't know what I'm gonna do, right? Everything fell apart and I had to know what's my purpose purpose, God. And the beautiful thing is this, you find your purpose in him. And your purpose is to know, is to be loved by God and love God back. And when you do that, everything else starts to fall in place. So do I have purpose? And does God love me? Yes, he does. God loves you. He loves every single person here. He's calling out to you. And he's asking you to listen to his word. When you and I align to his word, his created order can be released. When you and I do not listen to his word, we have chaos and destruction. You see, this is the truth of the matter. 
You're made by God. And, and um, the cells and all the other things of, of the universe have to listen to God's order. But God has given us the ability to receive or reject him. We do have free choice. And people say, no, you don't. Yes, we do. That's for next week when Pastor Rennie preaches that one. Okay. By the way, have you noticed, anytime I get into something controversial, I just send it forward, play it forward to Pastor Rennie. Okay. Uh, Psalm 139 says this. I praise you, for I am what? Fearfully and what? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know about you, but I am. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate that. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. I pray that your soul would know it well, that you matter to God. The biggest thing that we face in our society today, generally speaking, we mentioned a little bit last week, a lot of guys need to know, do I have what it takes? Do I matter? And a lot of women say, am I lovable? Do I have purpose? And my resounding answer to you is yes. And the enemy is out there to kill, destroy, and remove. He wants to destroy God's chief design on the planet Earth, which is you and me. Okay. The universe and you have purpose. God created the universe and you. The Bible says this in Ephesians. All right? I want you to focus on this. He chose us. In him before the foundation of the world. In other words, before God even made the planets, made the universe, he had you in mind. My children remind me of that. Dad, summer's coming. We get the plan for vacations. <laughs> All right? But God planned you beforehand. He knows everything about you. Before he said, let there be, he knew about you and he knew about me. How's that possible? Well, it is possible because God is possible. The Bible says it. Okay? He chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. The Bible says he wants all men to be saved. It says in 1 Peter, it says the reason why God is slow in coming back is he doesn't want one to perish. No, not one. He wants everyone to come to faith. So it's God's will that we all come to know him and align ourselves to God. When you have rogue cells in a body and they don't listen to the design of the body, you have something called cancer. And cancer multiplies quickly and it will destroy you. When you take your life out of God's design, you become a diseased cell and you begin to destroy yourself from the inside out. And it not only is it physical, it's spiritual, it's relational. And so our objective is to listen to our creator in love and have his design fulfilled in our lives. The Bible says sin is missing the mark. Hamartio, that's what it means, missing the mark. God has a mark, God has a purpose, God has a formula for your life. And when you and I go off that trajectory, we hurt ourselves. The good news, God forgives us and helps us get back on point. It's amazing. Everything works together. Everything works together. You'll see it in a few moments. In love, he predestined us. Okay, that's very true. Can I believe in God of the Bible and science? The resounding answer is yes. Some see the Bible and God incompatible. And the reason is they say, well, you can't believe that. Come on, give me a break. I, I can't believe for a moment that what you're saying is true. I mean, that's, that, come on, really? God created the heavens? I, I think it's, as I mentioned before, I think it's more preposterous, preposterous to believe that nothing came from nothing. There's a purpose in your life. There's a great design. It says in Romans chapter 1, although they knew God, they did not honor God and give glory to God, for what's known about God is clearly seen in the creation. All creation speaks, I am a designer. Imagine going to a restaurant, and, and, you say, and someone says, well, how do you like the food? The, the owner comes up, and you say, no, I don't like the food. You didn't create the food. It just happened. It just happened all by itself. First of all, a lot of chefs are pretentious. They'll probably throw you out of the restaurant, right? God has a purpose. Some see the Bible on God as incompatible. It's not incompatible. You see, the conflict between science and faith comes from either a misunderstanding of science or a misunderstanding of the Bible. 
okay? So either the science is wrong, and by the way, have you noticed that science is a little bit wrong sometimes? Okay, yeah, we can talk, give you many, many examples of that. Do you know George Washington died because of a misunderstanding of a biological science? They used to think that bloodletting would make you better. You want to get the bad blood out of you. So guess they bled George Washington to death. I mean, that's just an example of what they used to do. That's bad science, right? And bad, bad theology is like bad science. So it's a misunderstanding of science or misunderstanding of the Bible. I like what Albert Einstein said. You know who Albert Einstein is? Not the Einstein bagels, for those of you a little younger. Okay? A legitimate conflict between science and religion cannot exist. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. So science is a discovery of how God did what he did. It's figuring out what he did in that way. You see... I want you to focus on this for a few moments. You guys ready to put your thinking caps on a little bit? All right. In the beginning, what's the beginning mean? In the beginning, God created out of nothing. In fact, this particular verse in the Hebrew actually is taking, he made substance out of nothing. When God created man, he used the substance that was there to create man, which we'll get into in a few moments, all right? You guys tracking with me? Okay, the donuts are going to be out afterwards, okay? You'll, you'll, I'm going to reward you guys for this, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Now, earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Wait, what happened to the face of the deep? Where did the waters come from? It doesn't tell you, does it? It just tells you that there's chaos there. We'll get into that in a few moments about, with the possible theories, all right? Now, in John 1, 1 says the following. This is John. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made, what? Through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is called the Logos of God. Jesus is the formula of God. What is logos? What is word? It is of symbols and sounds. It's like a formula. In fact, you can read many things. It's amazing that, that math, math will prove a lot of things, by the way. So when Jesus spoke, he said something that released something. He was the catalyst that God used. Now, I'm not done yet, okay? He was in the beginning. Everything is made through him, Okay? There, there are people today, scientists say, and they're trying to figure out what is the components that hold the universe together. Some say that about 25% of the universe is something called dark matter. What that simply means is they don't know what it does. Uh, they, they can see the reactions from it, but they cannot measure the particles. And we have found molecules and atoms and sub, subatomic particles. We're finding more and more complexities as we break it down. It's almost like one of those Russian uh, dolls. If you see those Russian dolls, you, you have a big one. There's a smaller one, smaller one, smaller one. Yeah. Are, you, are you talking about Putin? No, I'm not talking about Putin. We need to pray for Putin. But the, it just gets more and more complicated. In the beginning, it was the word. It was with God. The word was with God. He was and made. Everything was made through him and without him. Not anything that was made was made. Now, he is, Colossians talk about Jesus here. So Jesus is the word that became flesh. There's something that holds the universe together. It's called the, called the theory of everything. The theory of everything is what scientists are looking for. What is that? We're trying to find what, what the theory of everything is. What is the thing that makes everything come together? They don't know yet. You've heard about the God particle. Well, that's, that's another whole other story. They're trying to figure out how everything works, right? How does everything work? They're, they don't know. They can measure what's happened, but they don't know. Why does it all work together? How does it all hold together? Who makes the rules? Thank you. He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? He's the firstborn of all creation. Now check this out. For by who? Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, the heavens and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, so it talks about the hierarchy of the spiritual realm and around here, or rulers or authorities, all things 
And by the word, all in Greek means? And things are what? Things. Okay. All things were what? Created through Jesus and for him. He is before all things. Now check this out. And what? All things hold together. In Jesus, all things hold together. God spoke. He spoke formulas, and things came together. He spoke things into existence, and the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together. Now, what's so amazing about this verse is they had no understanding of science, and today they're saying, we don't know, but there's something that holds it all together, the theory of everything. We don't know what it is. I got news for you. It's Jesus. How can that be? Just because you can't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Right here is a theory of everything. It's not a theory. It's a fact. How can you say that? I believe to be true. When, we're going to do a series on the Bible. I don't know when. We're trying to figure out when we're going to do it. The Bible is amazing. It's the most supernatural thing on the planet, really, as far as anything that's ever been written. But nevertheless, so... Um, all things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and all things in him hold together. So he's going to hold your body together. He's going to hold your relationships together. He's going to hold your money together. He's going to hold everything you have together. But there's one thing that you and I have to do. We have to what? We have to submit. Submission is absolutely imperative because if we are a rogue cell in the kingdom of God, we create cancer in our families and our finances in politics and in the world. Jesus is pure. And so what we want to be able to do is say, Father, I'm aligning to your will. As Jesus says, not my will, because he was on the planet as a human being, but your will be done. So I'm going to be congruent with God. I'm going to fulfill his design rather than my own, and go rogue, and become a cancer. So, and in him, all things hold together. He holds everything together. Now, the good news is you can say to you about your family. God, my family's a wreck. Thank you, you hold it all together. And start with me, Jesus. Let me be, let me be, the, let me be the catalyst to change. Lord, I submit myself to you. It's all about tender surrender. The tender of the kingdom of heaven is surrender. Jesus holds the universe together and holds you together, okay? Now, this is what the Bible says about Scripture. All Scripture, what? Is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be uh, complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let me say something about the Bible. 66 books of the Bible, it is like a library. In the library of the Bible, you have letters, you have poetic books. You have eschatological books that are a lot of it symbolic. You have narrative. You have history books, right? And so you have to understand that. And the first five books of the Old Testament, according to tradition, we believe to be true, Moses, who brought up in Egypt, actually wrote, under the inspiration of God, the first five books of the Old Testament. And the, the importance of biblical understanding and biblical interpretation is you have to always understand who wrote it and who did they write it to, what was the circumstances. When Moses wrote the Genesis account, he was talking to a nomadic people that were enslaved for over 430 years, and he was telling them what they needed to know. They didn't even care about science. All they wanted is food. They wanted the American dream before the American dream was even the American dream, right? And so he wrote it for that group of people. Its purpose was to align mankind with God, not to describe all the science. And some of the things used were pneumatic devices, to help people remember through the oral tradition. It was the first day of the first day. And so it was morning and evening of the first day. And it has a pattern to help you remember. Are you saying that it's all sim? I didn't say that. You said that. Aren't you going to tell us what you believe? No. Because no matter what I say, people will be upset with me. So if you want to know, ask Pastor Randy. <laughs> what about evolution in the Bible? Okay. There's, Mike, there, there's all kinds of, of things in Scripture. Um. There is the cell, um, for example, the adaptation of animals. 
Clearly, we can see that horses and elephants have developed over a period of time. So that's one thing we can see. We can see the development, right, that things are, they, they, they are able to adapt. But we don't see anywhere where one type of species jumps to another. That never happens. For example, we don't see an ape becoming a human being. We can see um, horses and other, other animals of its kind grow and adapt to its environment, but we never see entire entity change into a complete different one. And there, my friend, is the problem with biology. They're like, I don't know how it did. They're missing links. That's the missing link because they have it wrong. They have some things right, okay? Science answers the question, how? But it needs help with the question, why? That's where theology comes in. And this is what a great scientist said. And by the way, there's so much I could say about this and go on. Let me just say this in Psalm 104.5. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. Say, the, uh, theologians read that. Okay, the earth is static. It's on its foundation. It cannot be moved. Therefore, there's no rotation. And so they took a poetic thing and made it literal. You see that? And Galileo was persecuted because of this verse. So what happens is the church will take a few items and make a doctrine out of it instead of seeing the whole and making minors majors and majors minors. So this is part of the problem is that we've read the Bible, we've interpreted it a certain way, and we keep it that way over a basic verse. And of course, this is poetic. Psalms is a poetic book. And parts of Isaiah is as well. And so we have to read it. It's very hard to understand sometimes. But we have to come very humbly and to look at it. You see, I like what Alistair McGrath said. He's an Oxford professor. said this, science and faith should be seen as friends, not foes. And the quest for truth, the real conflict, is not between science and religion, but between bad science and bad religion. Now, there's a lot of bad science out there, and there's a lot of bad Christianity out there, except, of course, for Cornerstone Church, where we have everything figured out. <laughs> so Isaiah 40, 22 says this. Now, check this out. This is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay? People thought the earth was flat, right? Look what this says. It is he who sits above, what does that say? Do we have... Do we have any satellites back in those days? No. There's people today that don't believe this yet. They still think we're flat, okay? I don't like flat soda. I, don't, I can't. Anyhow. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Now, who stretches out the heavens. I want you to remember that phrase. Stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. There's so much... Uh, scientific imagery in here, you're going to see it in a few moments. Okay? So there's basic three theories about creation. One is a literal creation. It's six 24 hours days, and the seventh day he rested. Can that happen? Absolutely. God can do whatever he wants to do. After all, he's God. I think it takes a lot less faith to believe that than something jumps out of a little pond or a little, where did the pond come from, and who put all that amazing information in that little primordial thing that jumped out? that little whatever it was, okay? Literal creation. Then we have the Big Bang creation where they believe God spoke and it came into light. You know, they actually scientists believe that it wasn't until 1960, I think it was 63. Let me see when it was. It was uh, 1963 that the cosmic microwave background universe was one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. They used to believe that the universe always was, and then they found out in 1963 from scientific research, they saw a dispensation. In other words, that the radiation is dissipating and that they can see through the telescopes that the Earth, the whole universe is expanding and still is. Therefore, there was a beginning. And some would even say that the entire universe began with something smaller than the head of a pin. And then, phew. so Big Bang creation where they say God spoke and it happened. And a lot of people believe that the stages of creation can be found in some of the evolution theory, not all of it, and can be explained in that. And it cor corresponds with the book of Genesis. Then we have the gap theory. What's the gap theory? The gap theory is 
this is really interesting, and some of the ancient Jew, Jews used to believe this as well, is they believe what happened was that there was a pre-Adamic race that happened on the earth prior to the earth, and Satan had a, was in charge of the earth, and he rebelled against God. I know it's a big story. It sounds like something, a Thor movie. But nevertheless, he rebelled against God. There was all kind of a cataclysmic battle that took place. The earth was destroyed. God threw these people in a different place, and then he started over with man to start again. And that's what they believe. And so we get to day three. And by the way, that could be. I don't know. I, I just don't know. Could be. All right. Are you I mean, that's a real simplistic way to say it. I know. Uh, there's no way I can possibly, within the next six minutes, <laughs> describe the theory of the universe, but I'm going to try. I'm going to do my heavenest. Okay? So here's a fact time is relative. Time is relative. Einstein's theory of relativity is no longer a theory. It's been proven. What does that mean? Okay. It is true. Theory, time is relative. Right now, in Indonesia, it's Monday. Okay, turn this thing off. Okay. So, Time is relative. I'm going to explain to you in a few moments. What's so amazing is Einstein talked about that. I don't have time to break it all down, and he did it through mathematics. Now, and very interesting here, uh, back in 1971, the atomic clock experiment to test Einstein's theory of relativity, scientific time dilation, uh, conducted October 1971. This experiment was known as the uh, Keating experiment. Here's the a, here's a details, Okay. Uh, method. They flew four um, atomic clocks and commercial airliners around the world. The first were both eastward and westward direction. The purpose was to measure the effects of both special relativity due to the high speeds of the aircraft relative to the Earth's relativity due to difference in gravitational pull. And when they came back, there was a difference in time. Those that went with the Earth's orbit went faster. Those that went against lost time. It's absolutely amazing. Now, it was 0. 0.00000. Now, if you go on a spaceship at the speed of light, which is impossible, and, and, and you were to go from here to here, okay, maybe it takes you three, three seconds, okay, and you're on Earth, and you're walking like this, same uh, six feet you're walking, takes you three seconds. The experience for me on Earth is three seconds. The experience for the person on the spaceship, which we had not designed yet, nor do we have, at the speed of light takes three seconds, and literally hundreds or perhaps even thousands of years could, could, could happen based on the speed of the aircraft or whatever, the spaceship. Now, all right, now that I'm totally confusing you, I do believe in a six-day creation. I believe it was morning and evening from God's perspective. God's outside of space and time. I'm going to try to illustrate it with this balloon, all right? In this balloon, let's say God blows up the universe. Remember, it's expanding. So if I pass out here, anyone knows how to do CPR, please. <laughs> okay, start off like this. Perspective from here. There's a little circle here. Okay, there's time. There's one day. So. <laughs> And what has happened to the circle? It's getting what? It's getting bigger. It's the same circle. It's stretching. So from God, it's one day. From here, it's a billion years. Einstein talks about that. They even show that gravitational pull and light show that. And I have so many other amazing things to tell you. I did so much research, it's pathetic. I didn't even know where to begin. It's like going to a buffet, not where to begin. But it's amazing that it actually, it actually does that. Space and time expand. So from God's perspective, it's a day. From our perspective, it's a thousand years. Okay? But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years in a day. The theory of relativity before it had science. Hello. Is that amazing? As we have to hurry up. All right. Got to save it for the next service. All right. Here we go. I'm a little lightheaded now, okay. Okay, now I'm gonna just, guys, I know this is a lot. So, uh, but here's the Bible, science. Years before Adam, Bible, science. Okay, so we have day one, 24 hours, according to God, and I believe it's true. And it could be literally 24 hours, okay? Then we have eight billion years takes place. And if you do the math, I don't have time to show the mathematical co uh, computations. So you have eight billion years takes place. 
That's 15 and three-fourths billion years before Adam, okay? And that's the creation. Big bang, we say creation. God said, let there be. Boom, right? 20 for second, 24 hours takes place. Second day, that's four billion years, seven and a half billion years before Adam, the heavens. What happened? The Milky Way. You're gonna read it and see yourself, okay? Then we have the third day, 24 hours, two billion years. That's three and a three-fourths billion years. HTO and dry land and plant life. So then can water life. And by the way, the stages of creation on earth agree with what science sees. Okay? And, and even the gap theory, they think in the, okay. Translucent atmosphere, I can go on like this. 24 hours, one billion years, one three-fourth billion years, sun and stars become visible. What begins to happen? Uh, transparent atmosphere. Then we get 24 hours, a half a billion. You get the idea. So basically, the whole thing of the whole sequence according to scientific observation, what we're able to observe, and what the Genesis account corresponds with each other. The only thing that's a problem is the time, but now we know time is what? It's relative. So if someone says that, that is, no, if you disagree, I, which one do you believe? I didn't tell you which one I believe. I'm just telling you that time is relative. Can God, can God do it in six 24-hour days? Absolutely. The celestial lights were not created or not seen to the fourth day. And by the way, you know what's so amazing? I just was reading this the other day. Uh, it is astounding. Interesting enough, the Bible says, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. Do you realize that before light happens, when there's an explosion, the black hole, it, it sucks all the light away. But when it cools down and things change, light begins to show itself. So light was always there. It's amazing. Science tells us that light and darkness were mixed together in plasma during the early universe. And as the universe expanded and cooled, light separated from the darkness. He separated the light from the darkness. Now that's amazing. We had the Bible written from not, no science. And they're basically describing what now science is talking about. Now what does that all mean? I'm so glad you asked. Okay. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows it. It's our work. And I ask the worship team to make their way because we need to land this plane. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. I go outside at night. I hear the birds singing. They're sound kind of happy, right? I see the bats eating the bugs. Can I hear an amen? Thank God for bats. Only in, no longer they're not in your house. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known, okay? Now, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What does that mean? I didn't make this thing, place. I didn't make myself. I didn't make the world. I'm gonna give respect to my creator. You do that, you have wisdom. If you say, there's no God. I don't fear God, you're a fool and everything in your life will fall apart. I don't believe God in my relationships. I do what I want to. I don't believe God in my entertainment. I do what I want to. Chaos ensues. Order is God, chaos without God. God's ways are higher and they're better, right? The fear of the order is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, okay? We can see it throughout the scriptures. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on the strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. In other words, God's plans and works will never be moved. Now, looking to who? Who created everything? The word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. Okay. Just like God created the universe, he created you. Check this out. Looking unto Jesus, the founder of and perfecter of our faith, actually says the author of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame and seated at the right hand of God. So Jesus is the author and the constructor of your faith. Why not submit yourself to the God who loves you, who knows you, he knows every follicle on your head, he knows every cell, he knows every mutation, he knows everything about you physically, mentally, and spiritually. Why not submit to the person who designed you, who knows you better than you know yourself? You wanna have a good life, you wanna have a worthy life, you wanna have a life for eternity, we have to start Stop being rogue and be smart and fear God. He's our creator. He knows better how to run stuff than us. And to make things even better, he loves us. How do you measure love? 
scientifically, how do you measure love? This way. It is finished. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Jesus, that you love every person here. And Lord, some of us are experiencing chaos in our relationships, chaos in our bodies. Lord, we don't even know what we're supposed to do with our lives, where we're tired, where we're getting out of school, trying to start our lives. Maybe we're in midsection going through life. We don't know what's going on. We're just living by the clock and just getting paychecks and just... We feel like we're in a, in a factory of slavery. But Father, I want to thank you that every single person here is designed by you and made by you and has a redeemable purpose. Father, we don't want to be fools. For we know the beginning of wisdom is great respect for you. Which means we're not stupid and rebel against your design. <laughs> Lord, we've all been stupid. Lord, I pray for right now errors of our lives that we're being stupid and I'm gonna just go ahead and say it. we're being fools, fools with our finances, fools with our relationships, fools with our entertainment, fools with our eating habits, fools with money. Father, we wanna to say to you right now, you're the author and you're the completer of our faith. You are the great designer. We say yes to you.